one other figure, Delhi has got about 2.1 lakh security guards. One, but 2.1 lakh. But on any given day, not more than 1.6 lakh are in position. These are the figures Sundar, Mr. Bajal gave me. Uh, that uh, uh, that 2.1, but on any given day, 1.6 are in Delhi. Others are back in villages trying to use Nrega uh, wage. So they, it has created this kind of instability in the market. Mumbai has been much more adversely affected, where people live for six months in Mumbai and six months back in the villages. So in case you were, um, these are not very good examples, but in case you had a maid, she works for six months, goes back to village for six months. So there's the instability in the labor market um, has uh, certainly come as a result of Nrega. Now whether it's good or bad, we don't know, but. So within the village, sir, I was uh, uh, looking after uh, Nrega for quite some time as a district commissioner who owned the And it was a complaint of uh, the other uh, working groups, like uh, people who employ uh, laborers in the, in the villages. It was hard for them to find labor for agricultural operations uh, since Manrega has come. So it is even within the villages yeah. that this crisis has come. That's why I'm saying labor market not only in urban but also in the rural. If they are absent, we'll say, Punjab, Punjab is facing severe shortage of labor. No one can to Punjab anymore. Either the wage rates that Punjab offers is low, or they're very happy where they are. I mean, they have uh, labor, they're going to be very popular in Punjab. Fine. People are getting local employment to Punjab. Absolutely. 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 Now, whether we are distorting the labor market by, by these centrally sponsored programs, those are different issues. And I think we should have a separate session on the impact of these on rural urban migration. That's a very important subject. Right? I think the, the point that you're raising is very important. Do you think there is an argument in favor of controlling this migration in your economic view? I mean, we have seen this. I gave you the example of China. That even when there are restrictions, mobility is part of I think, culture. People must move. Uh, those who are not moving. Uh, that is the premise on which Pura is based. Uh, our former president, sort of here program the um, urban services in the rural area of Pura. No. Because it is not just the services, not just the services for which people stay in one place. They need employment. They need. So, it's very difficult, but uh, the basic needs, the education and the job that we are provided there, and then we were making those rural areas out. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's actually what you say. <laughs> Let's make the, our country exactly side out. Okay. Yeah, that yes, would be the case. Um, I didn't want to keep on giving you these examples from Malaysia and Indonesia, the one that I remember. They did estimate the cost of uh, uh, throwing down the urbanization uh, through these measures. And the estimates were well, these are World Bank reports. They said the throwing down the urbanization is far more expensive than trying to manage, learn to manage large cities. And that's much more economical compared to the cost that you would incur in um, making rural settlements. As so then you were saying something, right? I am going to be talking on school budget. Okay, okay. So Mayaram is, uh, Mr. Mayaram is coming, and he would be. Is, but do raise the instability in the labor market to ask him. Maybe my perceptions are not very clear, but Mr. Mayan will be able to do it. And he will also deal with Pura. So he will he will deal with Pura, he will deal with Rega, and he will have a bunch of perception. Let's get back to um, so this is how the this is how the JNURN was actually born. The, it really is very serious and it is so those three things, land, infrastructure, and services. And well, I was talking about the, the 
with other distractions. Um, there are a couple of things for that. Um, one was whether there has been any, you know, as we move from decade after decade and the complexities of cities uh, really become much more intense. From a time, for instance, in the municipal corporation of Delhi, all municipal corporations, Calcutta, where a dog tax, there were taxing dogs, uh, or you were taxing mules and, and donkeys. All acts do provide for that. All acts, all municipal acts have provision that there would be tax on mules, there would be tax on, on horses, because that was a time when only municipal acts were made. People used to keep horses, and people used to keep tongas and cows and everything in their own houses. Now all our acts came into being in that time. So in, in one sense, the whole tax structure was very obsolete. Uh, in Calcutta, until about eight years, no, I a little more than that, um, there was a tax on you know, the water for Gobi Khat. If you are using a Gobi Khat, a Gobi Khat will have a different rate of water compared to um, the, the, the other kinds of high, the highly complicated structures which at that time made sense, like 100 years back, but somehow they were not going to change. So the, the one conclusion of these one or two very straight examples is that the acts were not being, not being updated according to the new complexities which were arising. Uh, they were not being interested, they were not being restructured, uh, they were still the same. Why the problems of the change? Why? Second was what uh, really no sense of uh, any openness or transparency in the system. Why these pressures have been rising that there should be participation, there should be greater democratization at the local level, uh, the public affairs group in Bangalore, uh, talking about the you know, how fast things happen, whether your building plans are approved quickly or not. All these issues, micro, very, very, very micro issues, with which all of us are concerned in the day to day business, they were somehow get obscured in the, uh, uh, in the way the municipal system is functioning. Just to tell you about the municipal function, I, I don't know whether some of you have ever observed the municipal commissioners. You have. You would know that there is nothing that a person can do in the city without going to the When you are born, then you need to go to the bank. When you die, you try. You need a birth certificate, you will be dead. But intermediate steps also cannot be done if one looks at the law without the inspiration. You want to live, you want to apply for a building, go to the You want to start a shop. Go to society. You want to run a, a transport system, go and get a license. Then nothing that is a, a citizen uh, can do, that is the local government system. The whole origin of the local government was that local government must know what goes on in the city. It must regulate, it must facilitate. That. But all the theory of 19th century when the local government really came into being in the they somehow we were still obsessed with them. And they continue to be, or they continue to be on our stack. Nothing has changed. Um, so that was one part. Second was the transparency and the democratization and the local level. They started weighing on our minds to what extent we should bring a public participation in, in the rent of the city, to what extent the civil society needs to be brought in, into, into the function of this. Now, all these led to uh, almost like a list of 25 things that needed to be done in order that the city can function efficiently. Any is about that. Any is a, a 
reform thing can't visit. The data is not that. None of the other programs of the government of India are in the same mold as the as the N1. Not a single one. This is this, this is number one, this is not a single response, this is ACA, which is uh, additional central assistance. A reform big grant facility where the central government thinks of being that we take care of your infrastructure. You act on those things which would make those investments that we are making <coughs> sustain. If you don't act on changing your laws and systems and procedures and methods, those investments for which we are giving you money will not be sustainable. You will again fall in the same trap if you do not revise your property taxation. If you do not revise your legal charge system, the investment that are being made in water supply will once again fall in the, it would be a, a rich bucket you are putting in money, but you are not taking corresponding steps so that that investment can be sustained. So user charge reform must become the uh, water supply thing. One of the interesting things that we noticed was, unlike in the olden times, you know, like we were locked out for a meeting, and we locked out, there was old chance to And he said, sir, when in Lucknow, we have bought a supply control project sanction, we have bought a supply control project sanction. We have bought a a water supply project was never sanctioned, unless it was accompanied by a secret. But now, everything is in so you have water supply without thinking as to where would the waste water go. And the water will obviously will come out of the road. That's what happens today. Now, all these things were brought in in one way or the other into the annual flow. That when you're embracing a water supply project, don't look at water supply alone, but look at it to whether user charge is being raised, whether the corresponding is taken to ensure that wastewater is appropriate to go from, all these are looked at in an integrated fashion. That was the logic or the rationale behind the uh, rationale. Uh, and among the things that uh, you say to reform, what is the reform component here? Repeat your Land Ceiling Act of 1976. Everyone agrees that when it has done more damage to the land market than any other single act, begin to look at your stamp duty after 1899. If the stamp duties are still 8% or 9%, you can be just assured that every transaction would have two components. One would be a white money, and another one would be a black money. Reduce it to a point where it becomes uh, to pay. After all, stamp, what is the purpose of stamp duty? The stamp duty or the stamp paper is nothing else but the evidence of a legal of a transaction in the court of law. That's all that is. You want it, this is your thought. That's the evidence of a transaction and that can be proved in the court of law. It is no revenue implication per se, but it can become a huge revenue to now. Huge revenue to In Maharashtra, this is the third most important revenue for the state. And therefore, the tendency to keep it high is very strong. Without realizing that high rates are not necessarily a new thing. I mean, no matter what you talk, the state governments continue to think that high rates will take them over. Dr. Chalaya's report of 1993 was exactly opposed. He said, lower the tax rate, you will have more than And that was the reason why we had point revenues both on the income tax side and whether it's indirect taxes and taxes on the next side. The process is formed very great in scale. So we looked at all these issues as part of the um, Many people have said that, look, it's a quasi-market response to our issues. The opening up. You are doing away with these laws. You are inviting or attracting private sector into these services. Um, it's a quasi-market response. Uh, 
And the way we have sort of or at least my response is mean that when the previous system didn't function. If the previous system didn't function, would you not like to experiment with another system? That's it. Let's try it. If it doesn't work, you always have the option of giving it up. And you are in. And in fact, the current indications are that it may not remain the way it is in the request by your friends, the administrator has some very strong view, Mr. Kamalath. I some very strong feel about it, but that's a different issue. Um, so that's where we are. I mean, it was rest, it was based on uh, very clear premises uh, that unless you begin to look at your old apps and procedures and systems, our cities will not become complicated. They will not respond to the requirements of the poor. Security of tenure is a very important component of the that in case you want to respond to some proliferation that is taking place, allow people to make their own investment by making their stay secure. That's all. We are not saying give them that. They said security tenure. Give them security of tenure. And if the person knows that he's not going to be a good day for the next 10 to the year, he will begin to improve his own habitat in one way or the other. Not, not the type of this Now these are all the components, integral components of the uh, uh, Two other very special things in the sense we have people coming from the ministries uh, might be important for uh, them. But it is the only problem at the moment which is a partnership between the three levels. You are signing a memorandum of agreement with these three parties. I do not know if there is any other program connected with my law which requires requires the three levels of that kind of document. Yes, because there are actions to be taken by the state, there are actions to be taken by the centre. Only that. Transfer of property act, and duty, they all have central standards. Uh, and they don't have to be actually the back. This is only one. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the only program, uh, oh no, that before that I didn't do it. This is the demand. Gandhi is saying it's seven years old, but the year in which you want to do a particular reform is your option. Because it requires political courage. The government, the central government is not a specific fine of the reforms, there are 23 of them, as to what you should do in year one or what you should do in year two. It's only saying that this is the baggage. You choose your time in which year of the seven year period would you reform your property tax <coughs> or would you repeal the repeal or amend the stamp duty act or uh, you because it is demand based, the follow up course, then it can't really be run on the year to year budgeting exercise. We force the finance ministry of the ministry agree that it will be non tax If you are not able to spend money in year one, it is kind for the not happen. So all the all the money, it is the ACA, it is the Ministry of Finance, well, they are, they are funded, but then it is a non-absorbable fund. If the ministry is not able to spend it in year one, it doesn't matter, it's carried on to the second year. So all these are part of a very integrated exercise where because it is demand-based in the year one, no one comes. The political situation being what it is, you are not able to repeal, you are not able to reduce stamp duty. They all are highly political, politic, um, require political courage to be able to do it. So that is where we are. Um, I can't tell you as to what would go into the 12th plan, uh, but our minister is very keen that they present the focus of the NURM, which certainly is on 
uh, large cities and large city focus were deliberately chosen that, uh, first of all, um, uh, they are the ones who were, you know, our growth rate of 8%, 9% depends on how well these are managed. Uh, we always tell our friends that what happens in Bangalore is not decided by Bangalore, it is decided by what happens in Silicon Valley or, or what happens in Mumbai is not determined by the RBI or the Dalali Street, but it, it's really the Dalali Street there and the Wally Street in the US. So since these are these international linkages being developed between our cities and the, and the world market, um, it becomes very important that, um, uh, that we focus our, initially in the first round, we focus uh, our attention in the NURM on, on large cities. So it really was meant for the 35, large, 35 largest cities with one million population, all state capitals, and 10 cities of tourist importance for the reason that they bring in the foreign exchange. So places such as uh, Pushkar and such as Bodh Gaya, they were all included for that reason that they also have very international linkages, they bring in a lot of foreign exchange, and therefore our focus should go there. That's it. Our minister, who comes from Chindwara, um, in Madhya Pradesh, Mr. Kamal Nath, thinks that Nagar Panchayats are important. That happens to be Chindwara is a Nagar Panchayat. Um, and he says, well, large cities should really deal with, they have their resources, they should be on their own, and our attention or the central government's attention should really be on small cities and places like Chindwara. He keeps repeating in our meeting, in whenever you now that changes the whole context. No amount of our telling him that the issues of Chindwara are not urban, issues of Chindwara are economic. Uh, that's not cutting any ice. That's not cutting any ice. So we don't know what the final shape of the environment would be, whether it would be retained in the in the form that, that it is, whether it would be changed. Um, or whatever, we don't know. So that is, we think that the kind of things which NURM is seeking to do, there are lots of slippages. I'm not in the least suggesting that the way it was conceived is also being implemented. There are lots of slippages. Uh, and if one probes it, the usual things you will hear about NURM as you hear about other programs. Um, but we think that that is a much more sustainable way of dealing with cities in an open economy or quasi-open economy. If it was a closed economy, then you deal with issues in a very different way. And that is the way India used to sort of operate in the pre-1990 period. But in an open economy where the role of the state gets limited, gets restricted, because it's an open economy and what is happening across the border as influence you as much as your domestic policies, um, this is a much more saner way of looking at our cities. Um, the recent meltdown, the, the 2008, and what has happened worldwide, not in India, the, 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 we have not seen the impact of that on our city administrations, but in the developed countries, a very large number of cities have gone bankrupt following the, the meltdown. And there are special stimulus being planned for those cities in order to deal with. Cities are still you know, very much a part of the integrated systems and they are facing the onslaught of fiscal mel no, the, the, the mel financial meltdown, the, the global meltdown, as the higher tiers of government. So the, you are a part of a system where dealing with cities in a uh, highly close way may not be the, the, the right way. That's the way we look at it. Uh, but then everyone has um, his or her way of looking at. We think that this is a game changer. I think we would lead to a much better 
urban uh, system. If only we use this kind of an approach. Maybe there are other approaches which we have not experimented with. I've spoken for one hour and 40 minutes. You have not spoken at all, barring two minor interventions. I think I'm fair. It's only fair that I leave at least 20 minutes for. Uh, yes, please. Uh, would you like to throw light on resources and the and carrying capacity of the environment? We talk about GDP contribution to the GDP of the cities, but contribution to the consumption of resources per person. What is the electricity is being consumed? What is the water be, is being consumed by uh, city people vis-a-vis uh, -vis a rural person? And what is the impact of activity of uh, you know per person in a urban area to uh, the environment in comparison to what is the impact of ultimately sustainability should say uh, take into account the resources and the carrying capacity of the environment. Uh, Urban areas, vis-a-vis -vis rural areas, um, say how would you say in, in addition to the GDP? One number is GDP, which we all talk about, but you know the resource per person consumed by the city people, and the effect of whatever activity is happening in the you know uh, uh, urban cities on the environment, on the carrying capacity of the environment. If you want to so throw light on these two aspects. Uh, I, I, Sure. I, I'm looking at the figures which just by chance happen to be in my, in my folder. Um, first of all, there are two sets of figures. One is that our energy production is uh, increasing by about 8% per annum. Production of Yeah, no, I'm, I'm coming. And the energy consumption by about 6% annually. These may be slightly dated figures, but this is the, the one. But the, our per capita energy consumption has also risen from 100 kilogram of oil equivalent to about 337 kilogram. Uh, once again, the figures are slightly dated. Uh, but it is still very low compared to the average of 376 for low income countries. For low income countries. Yeah, I know your. And rural. I don't have the rural figures with me. I don't have the rural figures. But maybe next year, if I happen to come here again, I'll come prepared with the rural figures. <laughs> I, I don't have them with me. Um, uh, since I look at urban, I really sort of begin to make those kinds of comments. But I think your point is absolutely right. Well, there would be a huge difference. There would be a huge difference, not a minor one, but a very big difference. Very big difference. Then you said that uh, uh, Manrega is leading to instability of the labor market in uh, you know, urban areas. But uh, the other way of looking at it is that it is leading to stability of you know, the rural labor market. No, she's saying that rural areas are as much under, are under stress as the urban on account of these programs. They also have the same thing. I mean, six months here, or six months there. But I mean, the way we look at it. It has helped in reducing the migration. 